Good morning, Chairperson. Good morning, Mr. Sony. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Chairperson. Good morning, DCJ. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Uh, is everybody? And notification was given. Um, yeah. I was, uh, my colleague, Mr. Uh, Ingawana, sent me a message this morning. So I'm, I'm just trying to confirm, in fact, that uh, they are present so that uh, um, yeah. there is no come back on it. Mr. Ingawana, are you there by any chance? Good morning, Chair. Good morning. I'm, I'm not Mr. Rana. It's Ms. Makatini here from RMT Attorneys. Mr. Butelezi's attorney. Oh, okay. Okay. Advocate Galwana had indicated when the date was finished that he will not be able to attend as he's preparing for the commencement of his acting stint on Monday. Oh, okay. So I'm not yeah. sure if Advocate Sony had communicated directly with him. But in any event, our stance is that uh, today, as indicated in the previous proceedings, it was for the evidence leaders to make further probe to the two witnesses. And then uh, we will then take it from there if there is a need to cross-examine. I think that was what uh, Advocate Ngalwana expressed to the commission during its last sitting. Yes, the position is that uh, uh, he completed presenting his argument on, on the application for leave to cross-examine and uh, then an arrangement was made that uh, uh, the two witnesses would be recalled and uh, Mr. Sony would uh, put further questions to them. And um, uh, then once that has been done, then uh, uh, Mr. Ngalwa now his client would then decide whether they still wanted me to grant them leave to cross-examine or not. But uh, yes, that is where we are. I think we'll proceed then, and then we'll take it from there. Mr. Wilson? <clears throat> As you please, Chairperson. Chairperson, it, it, these are matters I was going to raise, and perhaps I should put them on record in the, in the fashion that uh, yes. was formally agreed so that yes. there is about it. Yeah. Shepherson, today, in respect of the evidence relating to Prosser, we are going to call uh, recall two witnesses, Mr. Ryan Sachs and Mr. Uh, Popo Molefe, both of whom you will recall gave quite extensive evidence. Yes. What prompts yeah. the recall of these witnesses, Chairperson, is the following. On the 29th of March, 2021, Mr. Sifiso uh, Butelezi, who was a uh, former chairperson of PRASA and to whom reference had been made in the report of Mr. Sachs and the affidavit of Mr. Molefe, uh, Mr. Butelezi submitted an application to cross-examine Mr. Sachs and Mr. Molefe. In support of that application, Mr. Butelezi submitted an affidavit. Now that affidavit, Chairperson, is part of the record and appears as SEC 17 of 2021. Now in the affidavit, Mr. Butelezi deals with a number of matters that he had been asked to address in a request sent to him uh, by the legal team. But that's not an issue today, Chairperson. Mm. 
His application to cross-examine Mr. Sachs and Mr. Molefe was considered by yourself, Chairperson, on the 15th of June. You indicated that the evidence leader and Mr. Butelezi's counsel, Mr. Ingarwana, should attempt to agree on the way forward. Now, having regard to the basis on which the application to cross-examine was made, the agreement reached between myself and Mr. In, Mr. Imbalwana, in, in it was communicated in a letter, uh, as far as this part goes, reads as follows, Chairperson. Mm. Sex and Mr. Molefe will be recalled on a date determined by yourself. At such reappearance, Mr. Mr. Butelezi's version in relation to each of the witnesses will be put to them by the evidence leader who will to the extent required by their respective responses further probe their evidence in relation to Mr. Butelezi as informed by the specific paragraphs of his affidavit in support of the application to cross-examine. I'm reading, if, mm. if it's, uh, I'm just trying to make sure that the yeah. record reflects what was said. Yeah. So it then goes on to say, in the event that Mr. Butelezi and his legal team should still be dissatisfied with the manner in which the evidence of Mr. Sachs and Mr. Molefe has been probed on the specific issues identified by Mr. Butelezi in his affidavit, Mr. Butelezi reserves his right through counsel to address the commission on these specific issues uh, that may require clarification, and if needs be, ask to re-examine the witnesses on those specific issues. Uh, I guess re-examine is not the right term there. To, to, to examine, Chief. Uh, I, I thought that was meant for Mr. Ngalwana. Yes, yes, sorry. sorry. So, yeah, so if they, they are, are not satisfied, then he will apply to you to examine them. He will apply to me for... Yes, for, for, okay. for leave to examine them on any matters yes. that he is not satisfied. Yes, well, uh, he, 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 has, he has already argued an application for leave to cross-examine. I guess that uh, that's what the rules provide for. So I yes. think what will happen there is that... Uh, once the today's session is done, then uh, his instructing attorney will uh, uh, obtain a transcript uh, or a recording and uh, make it available to him and his client. And uh, I think that at the end of the session, I will indicate a deadline by when they must indicate uh, whether they withdraw the application in the light of today's session or they persist in it or what they uh, would like to do with it. And then uh, I can then make a decision thereafter. As, if, as if, you if, if, it's not, if it's not withdrawn. Yes. Okay, all right then. Uh, yeah. Let's, uh, uh, Ms. Makatini, must I take you as simply observing as opposed to appearing? It, in light of what has been outlined, Chair, it will be more observing and then we'll wait for the chairperson's directive after today's proceedings. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Mr. Sony. As you please, Chairperson. Uh, yes. Chairperson, in, in the light of how Mr. Butelezi's affidavit is framed. He deals first with uh, matters dealt with by Mr. Ryan, uh, Mr. Sachs. So I'm going to call Mr. Sachs first, uh, Chairman. Okay, no, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, good morning, Mr. Sachs. M morning, Chairperson. Good to see you again. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for availing yourself once again. It's a pleasure. Yes, registrar, please administer the oath or affirmation. 
Mr. Sachs, will you be taking the oath of the affirmation? Yes, that I. Please state your full names for the record. My full name is Ryan Mark Sachs. Do you have any objection to taking the prescribed oath? No. Do you consider the oath binding on your conscience? I do. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you will give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, please raise your right hand and say, so help me God. So help me God. Thank you very much, Mr. Sonny. As you please, Chairperson. Uh, Mr. Sachs, you gave evidence before the commission on the 24th and 25th uh, of, Feb uh, of, of February 2021. That's correct. Your evidence was based on a report in which you dealt mainly with the flow of funds from Swafambo pursuant to its receiving payments from Prasa. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. Now, in your report and in parts of your evidence, you referred to Mr. Sefiso Buccellesi, the former chair of Prasa's board of directors. That is correct. Right. He has, Mr. Buccellesi has since filed an affidavit dealing with some of the matters raised in your affidavit, I mean, in your report and in evidence you gave subsequently. The purpose of calling you back is to put to you the challenges that Mr. Butilesi mounts against the correctness and in some cases, the truthfulness of what is set out in your report. Now, Mr. Butilesi's affidavit in which he challenges what you say uh, has been made available to you, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So I'm going to firstly deal with the allegations that are contained in your report de uh, dealing uh, uh, with the Swafambo contract. I want to refer you to bundle L, page 872, and in particular, paragraph 11.36.1 uh, to 36.4. I'll just quickly read to you what you said so we know what the ambit of the, the allegation, uh, of the uh, questioning for today is going to be. Okay. That's correct, that's fine. So, he, uh, in your report, you say, Mr. Butzelezi stroke Sabenza in the flow of uh, funds analysis shows that an entity, Sabenza forwarding and shipping, received 99 million rand from Sufambo. That you say at 11.36.1. And you say at 11.36.2, previous directors of uh, Sebenza include Mr. Butilesi, the former chair of the board of Prasa. And then at 11.36.3, you say Mababolo, and you refer there to an affidavit that was filed in the Swafambo uh, High Court application, alleged in his affidavit that Mr. Butilesi, while chairman of the board, failed to disclose his interest in Makana Investment Corporation, which has a 15% shareholding in Cadiz, a company allegedly providing advisory services to Plaza on the rolling stock. It has now been confirmed that it has a 55% shareholding in Sabenza, the preferred forwarding and clearing a service provided to Prasa, and in an 11.36.4, you say, in addition, per investigations at Prasa into disclosure of interest, Mr. Butilesi did not disclose his interest in Sabenza. Now, that's one set of allegations. And then at 11.36, uh, sorry, 38 on page 837, of the report. Uh, uh, 873, 
873 chairperson, yes. yes. It's very yeah. Mm. It says, at 11.38, you say, Bridget Gaza, who was a member of the board, I'm just adding that in, raised certain con uh, concerns about Sufambo in an email dated the 6th of November 2012 to both Mr. Butelezi and Mr. Montana, the former CEO. And in another email uh, to... Mr. Imbata on the 20th of um, November, 2012. Despite these concerns, Mr. Montana allowed the negotiations to proceed and the contract between Prasa and Sufambo was concluded thereafter. Now it is those two sets of matters that Mr. Butelezi complains about and says that his version should be put to you. I'm going to put his version to you in relation to each of those. Now, in relation to the emails, his version is put at paragraphs 21 to 31 of his affidavit. And in relation to the possible conflict of interest, his I mean, his version is put at 32, uh, paragraphs 32 to 46. I'm just going to look at those and ask you to respond to them. That's all. You have seen them, though, Mr. Mr. Yes. Yes, I, I have Mr. Butelis, the affidavit was provided to me. Right. So at paragraph 31, oh, sorry, 21, Mr. Butelezi says in regard to the two emails, he says the electronic email from Dr. Gaza dated the 6th of November was never received by me in 2012. Now, just for context, can I just say to you, in that email, Ms. Gaza addresses it to Mr. Butelezi and Mr. Montana, and she says she's received information that is not good about Sufambo's capacity to produce on in respect of this contract. And she says that if the information is correct, it would require an immediate intervention to the board. That's what she, she says in the email. Now, Mr. Butelezi says that he did not receive this email, and he says he didn't receive the email because the email address in respect of himself was the incorrect email address. Now, in fairness to Mr. Butelezi, I must point out that in regard to the 20th of November, the email that is sent to him has a slightly different email address. Um, his name in the first email is spelt wrongly. Are you in a position to dispute that he didn't receive that email? Chairperson, I'm not in a position to dispute that. And in fairness, as I say, if you look at the two emails, the email address on the first email, the email of the 6th of November, spells his name as S-I-F-I-S-O. And the second email, which just now I will show to you, he, he says he received, spells his name as F, uh, S, uh, F, sorry, as S, F-I-S-O. So it would make sense that he would not have received it. Yeah, I accept that, Chairperson. Right. Then he says at paragraphs 22, 23, and 24, had he received the email, he would have made certain inquiries from Ms. Gaza. But, I mean, that's just what he is saying. You don't need to respond to that. But he sets out what he would have inquired from her 
namely what was the nature of the information, where did she get it from, how is it that her committee missed out that information, and how would that information compromise the Swifambo contract? What is your reaction to that? I accept that. Then at paragraph 25, regarding the email of the, 20, uh, of the 20th of November, and if I could just point out that email was addressed to Mr. Chris Imbata and was, uh, and he was CC'd on that email. When I say he, Mr. Bertolesi was CC'd. And she says to Mr. Imbata, I've made these inquiries of you. Can you please confirm that everything is in order? It won't be appropriate to go on with this contract unless those inquiries are done. I'm, I'm just saying that that's what the email of the 20th of November says. You see that? Yes, I, I see that. Now he says in response to that, that that email was addressed to Mr. Imbata and that Ms. Gaza had sought information from him and his procurement team. He was not part of the discussions. He was the chairman of the board and he was copied on this in his capacity as such. Are you in a position to dispute that? I'm not in a position to dispute that, Chairperson. Then in regard to what he could have done, he says in paragraph 26, as chairperson of the board, I had no special powers to reverse the approval by the board of a recommendation made by the Bid Adjudication Committee and the FCIP Committee. He says it would have been a decision for the board to make if it considered it appropriate. What's your reaction to that? Again, I'm, Chairpers, I'm not in a position to dispute this. He says, on receiving the email, I suspect that I would have spoken to Dr. Gaza because she referred to capacity issues. He says, I equivocate because this happened nine years ago and I cannot remember every detail of the conversation. So he says, this is what he probably did. Are you in a position to respond I'm to not, that? I'm not in a, any position to, dis to, to dispute that, Chairperson. And he says at paragraph 28 towards the end that he believes that everything would have been resolved in that matter. And if there had been lingering concerns about Sufambo's capacity, the board would not have approved the con conclusion of the contract. Are you in a position to comment? Uh, I'm not in a position to dispute his, his, his views on that, Chairperson. Well, Mr. Sony, uh, shouldn't you identify those that uh, the witness can't really say anything about and, and uh, focus on those where he can comment? Yes, yes, as yeah. you please. That, mm. that, that, that's quite correct. Yeah. Now, you say in your evidence and in the report that despite the concerns, Mr. Montana allowed the negotiations to proceed in a contract between Prosa and Sufambo, and that contract was concluded on, uh, in March 2013. Mr. Butelesi responds as follows to that. He says, the CEO did not have the authority to conclude a contract without the approval of the board. And the board would not have permitted the conclusion of the contract if there were still lingering capacity issues or concerns. So my assessment is that Dr. Gaza's concerns might have been resolved between the 20th of November and the 25th of November uh, of March 2013, when the contract was concluded. 
Any comment on that? That that extract from our report, despite yes. these concerns, is uh, is is from Mr. Dr. Molepe's affidavit in the High Court proceedings. It was clearly stated in my report. Okay. Then, at paragraph thirty-two, he says, as regards the appointment of Swafambo as the preferred bidder. He says he played no role in that appointment and that uh, the, the, he played no role uh, that was no not played role. by other board members. No, no special role, I think, Mr. Sonny. Sorry, no special role, sorry. Yeah. You accept that, uh, Mr. Uh, yeah, I, I accept. Uh, I mean, not in a position to dispute that, mm. Chairperson. Mm. Now, in relation to the questions of his possible conflict of interest and benefits, at paragraph 33, Mr. Butelezi says, I did not derive a benefit from the award of the contract to Swafambo. In this regard, I need to dispel a few untruths in the evidence and innuendos of Mr. Sachs in his efforts, efforts to draw links between the various entities, including Makana, Sabenza, Keldas, and Swafambo on the one hand, and the award of the contract to Swafambo on the other. And he says there is no such link. Now, that's a general comment, but he deals with each of them in the subparagraphs, I mean, in the paragraphs that follow. I'm just going to go through those with you and ask for your comment on them. Okay. In paragraphs 34 to 39, uh, 38, he deals with Sebenza. And in regard to Sebenza, he says Sebenza is a clearing, forwarding, warehousing, and logistics company. Um, and among its clients was Swifambo. You accept that? Yes, I accept that. And among the things that it would have requir been required to do would have been to collect customs, VAT, and duty on behalf of SARS. Um, chairperson, I accept that uh, what it says in Mr. Butlezi's affidavit. Um, I just need to reiterate that my mandate, as I was appointed by the Hawks, was to perform a cash flow analysis of the Swifambo bank account and mm. to state how Swifambo utilized that such funds received from PRASA. And mm. payments were made from Swifambo to Sabenza, which I stated in my report and which were clearly stated were subject to further investigation. This is Mr. Butelezi's view, and I accept that this is his view, but those investigations, as clearly stated, need to be ongoing. So that, at, that, at this point, that's all I can, I can say. I, I yeah. accept that this is Mr. Butelezi's uh, view. Right. Now, in regard to his association with Sabenza, Mr. Butelezi says, Sabenza, at paragraph 35, Sabenza managed the imports of trains for Swafambo. The relationship between Sabenza and Swafambo started in April 2014, more than a year after Prasa had awarded the contract and signed the agreement with Swafambo. He said he resigned from Swafambo as a director of, uh, of Sabenza in December 2013. So at that time, he was not a director. You accept that? Yeah, December 2012, uh, paragraph, end of three. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I, 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 I accept, uh, accept that. And my report did state that he was a former director of Sabenza. I'm just going to point that out. That's yeah. Correct. Then at 36, he uh, paragraph 36, he emphasizes the point. He says, at the time Prasa concluded the contract with Sufambo, uh, he was no longer a director of Sibenza. And therefore, there was no need 
to point out any relationship, or uh, he needed to point out any relationship between him and Sabenza because he was no longer in You accept that? I accept that, Mr. Mr. Butter, there's his view. He says, in any case, had there been a relationship, he would have declared the conflict of interest, uh, of interest not from his directorship of Sabenza, but from Makana's uh, 55% shareholding in Sabenza. He said he would have disclosed that. I accept that's what Mr. Butelezi says. In regard to the payments made to Sabenza, he says that a total of 100,524,597 rand was paid to Swafambo. You accept that? He says, uh, uh, Mr. Sony, that uh, Sabenza billed Swafambo an amount of 100 million. Um, oh, so the amount that was, that was paid was, was different, that was reflected in Swafambo's bank accounts. I think there's oh, a difference between amounts billed and amount paid. Yes. No, 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 I understand. Can you yeah. recall just offhand what was the amount paid to uh, Swifambo? The amount paid to Swifambo was, I'll get you the exact amount, um, 99,284,090 rand per person. Okay. That's, that's as it's reflected in the bank account of Swifambo. Sure. That, so that was the amount that was paid, but the amount that was billed is slightly uh, higher. Yeah. Uh, yes. I, 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 I'll accept that. I, I haven't been provided with the police any further information over and above Sufambo's bank accounts. So I accept what Mr. Butelezi states saying over here. So you, at paragraph 38, you will see he says he obtained these details from Sabenza. I, yeah, I, I cannot, I'm not in a position to dispute that. Yes, okay. Now he says that based on what Sabenza told him, this is, the, this is how the bill, I mean, this is how the amount that was billed was spent. He says first at 37.1, 94,344,000 uh, 52 rand and 33 cents was paid for customs, VAT, and duty. You, you accept that? Well, uh, again, uh, Mr. Sonny, I'm not in a position. I accept that's what he said, but this information wasn't available to me when I was performing my investigation. Sure. But I accept, I accept that that's what said in Mr. Butelezi's affidavit. And that. Okay, I'm just going to put this to you uh, on the basis that you accept that this is what Swafambo says and you're not in a position to dispute. But just for the record, uh, that we will put these amounts on record. Are you happy? Yes, I, uh, I accept that, Chairperson. And he then says that an amount of 2,539,000. 665,000 rand and eight cents was paid to the shipping lines, that an amount of 165,377 rand and 15 cents was paid for finance, and an amount of 3,474,802 rand and 44 cents was the agency and documentation fee charged by Sufambo. That's what uh, Sufambo says and what Mr. Butelezi wants us to put on record. I accept that. Then, at par from paragraph 39, he deals with the allegations you make about him in relation to Makana. He says in your quoting at 11 86, you say that Mama Bolo claimed that Mr. Butelezi failed to, dis, uh, to disclose an interest in Makana investments 
when he was chairperson of the board, that Kana had a 15% shareholding in Cadiz, that Cadiz was at the time providing advisory services to Prasa on the rolling store. He says each of these is patently false. And he bases it on the following at paragraph 40. He says at 40.1, the public protector in August 2015, in her report date uh, uh, titled uh, Derailed, confirmed that Mr. Butelezi had dis disclosed his interest in Makana <coughs> and shareholder and in Cadiz as a shareholder. Have you seen the public protector's report? Uh, per person, at the time I performed my investigation, I was not aware that the public protector investigated that aspect. It was not part of the information provided to me. My report and my evidence I've itemized in my report, clearly the documents which I received and which I relied upon. And I accept that these are the public protector's findings. I'm not in a position to dispute the public protector's findings. And at the time you filed your report and the time you gave evidence, were you aware of what the public protector's findings were? No, I wasn't aware. Right. Now, he then says that Paragraph 40.2, Cadiz on the 23rd of November, this is after uh, Ms. Madenzela uh, submitted her derailed report, that Cadiz had written a letter to Ms. Madenzela saying that it had never tended for and had never consulted to Prasa for advisory services on the rolling stock uh, recapitalization project. And he attaches a letter from Cadiz to the public protector. Have you seen those? Have you seen that letter? No, it this is not. No, I, 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 besides Mr. Butelezi's affidavit, this extract, this was not evidence that was provided to me by the police. So I, I haven't seen it. I, Okay, but do you accept that that I is accept, the yeah. that, that case? I accept, I accept that this is what they say. And then, and then on the twin, uh, sorry, a paragraph 42, uh, Mr. Butelezi says that the former public protector in her letter of the 25th of November to Cadiz said the following. I have taken note of your assertion that Makana is and never was a subsidiary of Cadiz and vice versa, and that at no time did any of the companies within the Cadiz group provide advisory services to Prasa on the rolling stock recapitalization project and appreciate your enlightenment on the shareholding and distinction between the companies Makana Financial Services, Cadiz Holdings, Cadiz Corporate Solution, and Cadiz Projects, uh, Special Projects Limited. So the public protector accepted the findings or, or the explanation given by Cadiz. I'm just placing that on the record. I accept that the public protector's findings. <clears throat> then at paragraph 44, he says, uh, uh, Mr. Butelezi says, the public protectors, the new public protectors report also closed this matter and absolved himself and cadres of any wrongdoing and any improper involvement in the provision of services in the rolling stock recapitalization project. Are you aware of that? Uh, that just to read. And when you did your report and gave your evidence, were you aware of that? Again, I wasn't. This, this was not information that was provided to me when I performed the work I did at the time. So at paragraph 45, Mr. Butelezi says, there is no truth to the allegation 
that I somehow benefited from the award of the contract to Swafambo by, my re by reason of my association with Makanda, Jaders, and Sabenza. I'm just placing that, that that's his assertion. You want to comment on that? I'm not in a position to dispute his, uh, his assertion. And he says, in regard to the sort of profit made by Sabenza, it was more in the region of 3.5 million rand, although the, it received some 99 million rand, but he's explained where the, where the rest of the money went to. And, and that we've been through, that's what Sabenza's documents show. Yeah, I uh, accept that's what's, a, well, I accept that position. Um, again, at that time, that information was not available to me to investigate. Uh, provided to me by the police. <clears throat> Mr. Chairperson, uh, having regard to the purpose of this cross-examination, I have mm. no further questions for Mr. Sachs. I have put to Mr. Sachs, as I undertook to do to mm. my land in, in, in Gawana, all the assertions that yeah. Desi wanted to place on record. Yeah, no, that, that's fine. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sachs. I think uh, the issues that relate to you have been covered. Covered. You are now excused. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Mr. Saini. Thank you, Mr. Sachs. Thank you for making yourself available again. No, no problem. Thank you. Mr. Sony. As you please, Chairperson. Uh, Chairperson, I next want to call... Mr. Molefe uh, in, to deal with matters that Mr. Butelezi's affidavit raises about him. Yes, okay, all right. As you please, Chair. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Molefe. Uh, good morning, Chair Person. Thank you very much for coming back again and availing it's yourself. Pleasure. It's my pleasure, Chair Person. Thank you. Uh, registrar, please administer the oath of affirmation. Mr. Molefe, will you be taking the oath of the affirmation? Yes, I will. Which one? Oh, oh, the oath. Oath, oath. Uh, uh, um, You'll take the oath or affirmation. Oath. I'll take the oath. <laughs> I'll take the oath. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, well, I have uh, I've seen uh, uh, some witnesses. Uh, they do they take the oath when they depose to an affidavit, and when they come before the commission, they say they do an affirmation. So, <laughs> if you were hesitating, <laughs> <laughs> yes, registrar, go ahead. Please state your full names for the record. Simon Malefe. Do you have any objection to taking the prescribed oath? I do not. Do you consider the oath binding on your conscience? I do. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you will give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, please place your right hand and say, so help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Mr. Sony. As you please, Chief uh, I know, Mr. Sony, that uh, Mr. Mlefe was recalled to deal with uh, the issues raised by Mr. Butelezi. But I want to take this chance to say um, if we have not dealt with any issues that have been raised by uh, other witnesses, such as Mr. Montana, that should be raised with Mr. Mulefe. Um, an opportunity ought to be made so that those can be raised with him and he can deal with them. I'm not, I'm not saying today because he might not uh, have been prepared for today, but I'm just saying... Uh, that mustn't be forgotten so so that uh, issues that uh, 
they may have raised uh, about him or concerning him uh, that uh, need to be put before him so that he can deal with, he would get a chance to deal with them. As, as you please, Chairperson. Um, we, we will separate the two because, uh, as you rightly point out, Chairperson, with respect, uh, we didn't anticipate, but, but fairness would demand that Mr. Uh, Molefe is given an opportunity, should he so choose, to come back to deal with those matters. Yes, well, well, he might choose in regard to others, but uh, the commission might want him to deal with, with some, as nevertheless, as you know. So I think that uh, uh, it's important that uh, arrangements be made so that uh, he can deal with whatever needs to be dealt with. As, as, as you please, Chairperson. Okay, all right. I will, I, I will in due course, raise it with Mr. Malefis and, and the rest of the team, Jim. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm sure he's aware of, uh, of, 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 of all the issues. <laughs> yes. Yes. Mr. Mulefe, you are aware of uh, at least some of the issues. I, <laughs> Chairperson, I am aware of some of the issues. In fact, yes. I had read a very long uh, affidavit of Mr. Montana. And, yeah. Uh, no, the that, extent that's... that I uh, would be required to respond to yeah. any one of the issues, I'll do so. Yes. Although, although yeah. I do think that I had dealt with uh, extensively with the issues in my own affidavit uh, when I was giving evidence. Yeah, it may well be that some of the issues are issues that have been dealt with. Um, and if they have been dealt with, uh, adequately, there may be no need to deal with them again. What obviously we, we don't want is a situation where some issues slip through the fingers or they are not dealt with. Uh, those that have been dealt with adequately, there is no need to, no need to uh, deal with them again. But those that might not have been dealt with uh, that are important, they, they, they might need to be dealt with. But uh, that, that's fine. Thank you. Mr. Sony, do you want to uh, uh, proceed? Yes. Uh, Mr. Molefe, in regard to uh, your being recalled today, I just want to paint the background against which that has been done. Uh, you submitted an affidavit dated the 17th of February 2020, in which you dealt with various matters relating to PRASA, and you subsequently gave evidence based on that affidavit. Is that correct? That is correct, Chairperson. Now, in your affidavit uh, and in evidence you led thereafter, you made certain allegations against the former chairperson of the PRASA board, Mr. Sufiso Butelese. Is that correct? That is correct. Sorry, you are muted, Mr. I think he moved away from... Oh. Yeah, so uh, if you could just repeat your answer, Mr. Mlefe. I, I was saying it is uh, what counsel said is correct. Yes. Now, Mr. Butelezi has since filed an affidavit. I've got you place on record that we didn't have the affidavit at the time you or Mr. Sachs had testified. And therefore, what he said in his affidavit was not put to you. I am, though, now constrained to place on record what he says in response to some of the allegations you make about him. And I am then going to put those allegations to you or his responses to you and get your response to that. Now, firstly, you're aware that Mr. Butelezi has submitted an affidavit and you've been favored with a copy of that affidavit. Is that correct? That is correct, Chairperson. Now, I want to then refer you to certain paragraphs of the affidavit. And these are the paragraphs that concern you. At paragraph 50, 
four, uh, 52 of the affidavit, which uh, chairperson appears at uh, sequence 17, page 31. Mr. Yeah. says, I do not know how many statements or affidavit Mr. Molefe submitted to the commission. He says, the one I was given is dated the 17th of February, 2020. Chairperson, that affidavit appears in bundle D and as exhibit SS6. Yes, I've got it. And I, Chairperson, I just point out that there are two relevant paragraphs, paragraphs 18 and 21, but I will deal with them just, just so that you can yeah. orient yourself to the, uh, to the questions. Yes. Coming back, though, to what Mr. Bitelezi says, he says that in your affidavit, Mr. Molefe, you told the commission that you assisted in preparing the affidavit, presumably by Wurtzmans, your and process attorneys in the commission. I'd just like your response to that part of the allegation. I was not assisted. The, the, the affidavit to the commission. Yes. No, I was not assisted by Waxman's, no process attorneys in that regard. So the statement is not correct. Were you assisted in regard to that affidavit? I was assisted. Uh, I was assisted by the MNS attorneys. I see. Now, he says in that affidavit, you assert that you became a victim of state capture. Now, I take it this is the allegation being made in relation to your general notion of how state capture is operated, and in particular, your reference to Mr. Roy Woodley. Uh, that is correct, Chippeth. Now, as I is it correct to say that in your affidavit you allege you were a victim of state capture? My, I did say so, Chairperson, and I have articulated the context clearly in my affidavit and in my the evidence I gave to this commission. I, I have nothing you, more to add. I understood you, though, in the affidavit to say it was Prasa that was a victim of state capture? Or, or did I misunderstand the affidavit in that regard? Well, we, we, I did say that Prasa was a victim of state capture, but I did also say what attempts were made to, to as part of uh, consolidating the capture of Prasa to capture me as well. And I did refer Chairperson to uh, two or three instances. One related to the July handicap. The second one was uh, 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 the golf event organized by Mr. Moodley, both of them. The third one related to the intended trip to the masters, which I was doing regularly. And uh, this particular year, Mr. Moodley having heard that I was uh, attending the masters wanted to come along with me. Mm. Uh, the details thereof are set out in my affidavit and my oral evidence. Yeah. But, but as I understand it, you resisted all Mr. Moodley's attempts. I did, uh, Chairperson. Okay. Now, Mr. Butelezi then says, that you defend your appointment of Wurtzmans as Prasa at Prasa, despite the Auditor General having found that appointment irregular. What is your reaction to that? We, we, we have dealt, Chairperson, uh, with the processes leading to the appointment of uh, Wurtzmans. Uh, Mr. Butelezi might not be happy with how we have dealt with it, but I have nothing more to add. Mm. And was by whom was Prasa appointed, by you or by the board? Uh, 
spokesmen were appointed by the board, but uh, it did th- so through the management, the acting group CEO at the time. Mm. And then he says, you accuse him of misleading the board and weakening governance at Prasa. I'm going to deal with the affidavit in uh, th- those allegations in a moment. But let me deal with the allegation in paragraph 53. He says that you present yourself as a state capture buster. And, but he says you are no such things. He says for the reasons set out here under, I appeal to the commission to allow me to cross-examine Mr. Molefe. And he gives two examples. I'm going to ask your reaction to that. First, he says at 53.1, you irregularly appointed personal bodyguards for 6 million rand of PRASA funds. And the SIU is or was investigating the irregular appointment of Black Hawk's business solutions to provide that service. What is your reaction to that? The first point I am um, constrained to raise is that I do not need validation that I'm a, a state capture pastor. I mean, uh, that is a matter for uh, public records, so I don't need validation. With regard to the appointment of the Black Hawk, it is true that uh, they were appointed, but they were appointed not by me, uh, by the company. The circumstances under which they were appointed was that my life was under threat and we could not rely on the, the security that uh, Prasa had employed at the time. So you say they were not appointed by you. Uh, I didn't that is correct. Hear whom you say they were appointed by? Uh, by the company, by Prasa. By Prasa. That is correct. That would be the management. And, and, and I personally had no role in determining who gets appointed. Uh, was w- it a decision? When, 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 you, when you said PRASA, uh, you, are you referring to the management of PRASA as I, opposed I, to the board? Yes, I am referring to the management of PRASA, but of course the, the chairperson of the SHAC committee of the board, which was safety health and quality assurance committee would have been involved in the process. Yes. In, in, in engagement with the PRASA management. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Was, sorry, as you please, Chibis. Was a decision to that effect taken by the board itself? No, no. The decision was... Uh, well, the, the, the decision was taken by management, uh, having consulted with the chairperson of the Sheikh committee. It was not the board per se. So it, but it, it was the not board, a... the board the board would have approved. And when the board approved it, were you part of that meeting? I was not part of the meeting. <clears throat> then he says. The second point in relation to your not being a sanctions bus, I mean, your state capture buster is, he says, you and your board overpaid yourselves and you were ordered to pay an amount of 680,000 Rand back to Prasa. Well, firstly, it, it is true that there's certain remuneration that was paid Uh, to the directors. I was not involved in determining that. I was out of the country. Uh, When I came back, I found that there was money in my account. I I raised that matter with the company secretary. And knowing that remuneration of directors has to be determined by the shareholder, the executive authority, the minister, when I found that uh, the minister had not approved, I took a decision myself voluntarily without anybody having asked for anything from me 
and say that I'm paying back this money until such a time that the process of approval has been uh, effected by the minister. That's how I paid back the money. And I encouraged other directors to also pay back the money. Do you know if the others did? I don't know how many of them might have paid, but I know that there are others who did not pay it. But you paid back the full amount. That but I paid back the full amount uh, minus, well, the amount was actually more than a million, but the million included the money that was taken by SARS. So when I paid back, I paid back that 680 because the other money was with SARS anyway. So, and, and it didn't come from me. It had come from the company itself. So I, I couldn't claim it and there was no need for me to pay it on the advice of Prasa Treasury. Now, at paragraph 54, Mr. Butelezi says that you appeared at the commission on the 7th of May, 2019 in your capacity as the chairperson of the Transnet uh, Board of Directors. And he says on that occasion, you alleged that the Prasa locomotives, I take it those are the locomotives that are subject or, or were part of the Sofambo contract, were not fit for process. For purpose. Uh, for purpose, sorry. Now, firstly, is that what your evidence was before the commission? Remember, it happened under the Transnet stream. That, 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 that is correct, Chairperson. That would have happened as an example during the course of uh, uh, oral evidence and raised as an example. Mm. Uh, on uh, irregular procurement and... Uh, right. uh, now, in this, relation to that... Sorry, Mr. Are you finished? I'm done, yes. I'm so done, in relation to the allegation that those locomotives were not fit for process, Mr. Butelez... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not I'm, your day today. <laughs> I, I, I apologize. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Not fit for purpose. <laughs> yes. He says, this allegation is factually incorrect. And in support of that allegation, that it's the, your allegation is factually incorrect. He says, the trains were delivered in Cape Town. They are stationed in Johannesburg. They were not transported by air. They were driven through tunnels from Cape Town to Johannesburg and clocked over 70,000 kilometers. What do you say to that? Well, I can't, I can't argue that they were, they were driven from Cape Town. The factual position is that they were not fit for purpose. And this was clearly articulated in the advice that uh, Transnet Freight Rail, TFR, had given to Prasa to say that these locomotives are not compliant with our rail uh, and net infrastructure network as well as safety. So, so uh, that 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 to that extent, uh, the the Transnet uh, had given an advice. Well, let me. Let me I'm sorry, Mr. Sony. As you please. Uh, I, when I read this part of Mr. Butelez's affidavit, Mr. Mulefe, uh, particularly the part where he said these locomotives were not transported by air to, from Cape Town to Johannesburg, uh, they were driven through tunnels from Cape Town to Johannesburg. I understood him to be raising maybe indirectly the allegation that has been made from time to time that uh, 
I think they were too tall for 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 uh, they are too tall for the. I don't know what you call these things, <laughs> but they were too tall because that criticism gave the impression that they could not be used. Uh, now, I, I can't remember whether in your evidence you said anything directly on that when you talked about not fit for, for purpose, but maybe it would be good just to deal with this issue once and for all because uh, one does hear people who said, no, they were too tall, but then I think Mr. Montana, for example, also disputed that and said, you know, the, these locomotives were fine. So I, 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 I don't know if you want to say anything about the, this issue, uh, I, Mr. Mulefe. Chairperson, I confirm that the locomotives were too tall. Uh, yeah. I can't give the exact figures. But the requirement yeah. of Transnet was that the locomotives should not be, had to be below 40, four, four, uh, four meters high. Yeah. Uh, uh, which means they had to be around 3.9 uh, meters. That's yeah. the height. Yes. These locomotives came at the height that was above 4.1 meters. Yes. And uh, Prasa, together with Voslo, which is the company that manufactured them, mm. attempted to adjust them. They mm. reached a point where they could only adjust them up to four, four meters uh, mm. plus some centimeters. Mm. Uh, and Voslo said, we are unable to do anything more mm. than that. You know, mm. So you got to take them as they are. So, mm. so there's no question that they were taller mm. than, than was required. And mm. the second point is that although the locomotive might have traveled mm. along a certain uh, rail route from Cape Town mm. to, to Gauteng, but we mm. also had evidence where mm. some of them uh, bent, tried to, trying to go through certain mm. bridges and mm. I think that evidence was there, it was in the media as well. Mm. I, to the extent mm. that it becomes necessary maybe for me to respond to mm. some of the things that Mr. Montana had said, I could then find some yeah. of those reports, uh, contemporaneous reports of the time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, the reason uh, Transnet did not want locomotives that were too high, there were mm. also issues of safety. Mm. If the pentograph was too close to the electric line, the, mm. there was always a chance that uh, the, the, the locomotive could burn, like it happened when it went through that particular bridge that I am referring to. The mm. fact that they managed to get to Gaute does not mm. mean that they were fit for peppers. Yes, well... Uh... It's it, it, it's 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 important to, to I, I guess it might not be enough to say they were driven from Cape Town to Johannesburg unless one finds out uh, what was done to make sure that uh, uh, they reached Johannesburg safely. Uh, <laughs> On, on a lighter note, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, sometimes you get uh, people who who uh, drink alcohol, and after they've drunk alcohol, they like getting behind the wheel, and they won't allow anybody to drive their cars. They say they drive best when they have had something. And, uh, and they will tell you uh, the long distances they have driven after drinking liquor. And then uh, some people will say, well, they don't tell you how other drivers on the road suffered trying to avoid them. <laughs> so so it's, it might not be a full story. You know, you, that driver might reach home, but... Uh, uh, you don't know what happened on the way. So it may well be that uh, 
it's important to find out to what extent their height was a problem when they were driven from Cape Town to Johannesburg. But apart from that, also those who might be suggesting that tall as those locomotives may have been, they could nevertheless be used. They might have, those might have to deal with issues of safety that you, 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 you say, you raise, Mr. Mulefe, to say, well, it might not mean that physically they could not be driven, but there would be safety issues that uh, could arise. And that is why, uh, 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 why there would have been a, lim a requirement that they should not be higher than a certain height. They should not be taller than a certain height. That, that, that is correct, Chairperson. Um, uh, the, there are regulations. Of yes. The rail safety regulator. Yes. There are also uh, safety uh, positions taken by the owner of the, the rail network uh, infrastructure, mm. like Transnet. Mm. Uh, whoever uses that is required mm. to comply mm. uh, with the requirement. Mm. But mm. what I will do, Chairperson, uh, mm. is that uh, because we dealt with these details in the, mm. uh, the application before the High Court of Southern mm. Kauten, mm. when we, we sought a review mm. of, um, of the contract on these locomotives. These specific calculations were given in that regard. Mm. So mm. I, will, I will find that information yeah. um, and, and submit it. Uh, yeah. So that, so that the numbers could be, could be read. And then, yeah. then comparison could be made with these Afro 4,000 uh, locomotives. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sony? As you please, Chiris. <clears throat> now, in paragraph 55, Mr. Bittelezi says he wants to deal with certain allegations you make, and he deals with them in subparagraphs 55.1 to 55.4. Uh, just going to deal with each of them very briefly. He says that, and I can just refer you perhaps to the relevant part of paragraph 18 of your affidavit, where in the first sentence you say, to add to the board's challenges at the board's first substantive meeting, which was held on the 27th of November, 2014, its former chairperson, Mr. Sufisa Butelezi, advised us that he would be resigning immediately after the meeting. So that's the allegation that you make. Now, in paragraph 55.1, Mr. Butelezi says it is not true that he said he would be resigning immediately after the meeting. He says he gave notice at the meeting of his resignation, which was to take effect on the 31st of November uh, of December 2014. And he had given a letter to that effect to the Minister of Transport. There was no urgency to his resignation. He was not running away from anything. But let's forget the, the other things. The, the suggestion is he didn't say, or his version is, he didn't say at that meeting that he was going to resign immediately. It may well be that uh, he, he didn't say immediately, but what he said was that that was his uh, last board meeting. So he was not going to be in any other uh, board meeting after that. Okay. Great. So that it, he was the, the fact of the matter is that he was resigning. What the letter to the minister said, I I am not privy to. I, I guess I guess what 
what you the, the the your two versions, your version and his version, maybe are reconcilable. What you are saying is that the meeting at which he said he was resigning was his last meeting uh, at a particular level. But uh, the you were not aware of whatever letter he may have written to the minister, and you don't dispute that uh, whatever letter he may have written to the minister was to the, or may have been to the effect that he was going to um, resign at the end of December, or he would, his membership of the board would come to an end at the end of December. I, I, I do not dispute that, Chavis. Yeah, yeah. Or, Mr. Yes. All that I knew that that was the last meeting of the year of the board. Yeah, Mr. Sony, as you please. Did he give any reason for resigning? He he did not give. Okay, he did so not in, give. It. In sub paragraphs A, B, and C at paragraphs thirty uh, pages thirty three and thirty four of sequence seventeen. He sets out his reasons, and I'm just going to put them to you. He said the reason he was resigning is that it would be good for the company that a new person, a new chairperson operates without the yoke of a former chairperson. Secondly, it would not be fair to you that he, as a former chairperson, remained on the board because you had your own, he had his own way of chairing meetings. And thirdly, he says he considered it would not be fair because the new chairperson may want to criticize the previous board and his being present might be an impediment to such uh, uh, criticism. What, uh, are you in a position to comment on that? On, 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 on reflection on whether he gave reasons, uh, uh, let me say that in my conversation with him, he only said that he had served the board for a long time. It's more than two terms that he had been on the board. That's all. The reasons that are read by counsel to me were mm. never discussed with me. Uh, neither were they given to the board. Mm. And I can't dispute that Mm. That is what motivated his resignation. I can't, mm. I can't dispute that. Mm. All right. Then at 55.2, uh, sorry, before I read that, can I read to you another sentence from uh, paragraph 18 of your affidavit? The last sentence reads, Quite strangely, Mr. Buzulezi then made a submission for the approval of the appointment of service providers for the Brownfontein depot, depot modernization project and for the purchase of rails and turnouts, alleging that the tenders were urgent. Now, Mr. Buzulezi takes issue with your describing his request as strange. Uh, what, uh, Chairperson, so what did you consider? Oh, sorry, yes, go ahead. Okay, let, let me counsel proceed with the question, Fred. Well, I was just going to ask, why did you say that it was strange that he would make that request? My, my, my affidavit is written uh, after the fact. But there is a context uh, to that statement, Chairperson. Mm. The context is that uh, uh, Chairperson will recall that uh, at that meeting, just before the board approved uh, and after deliberation, there was a requirement, a request by the board that a property report be given to the board as an assurance, given that the tender that the board was being asked to approve 
was a tender that was running into billions and the board needed to be assured that, uh, uh, reassured that uh, the proper process was followed and the risk mitigation would have been taken into account. So therefore, the, the, the strangeness then <coughs> comes about because in the meeting that we consider this matter, it turns out that the committee that Mr. Mutelezi was chairing had never considered the issue of uh, probity. So I think that's really the context in which it arose. Mm. Yes. Okay. Mr. Sonu? As you please, Chivas. Mr. Mutelezi then says at the uh, bottom of paragraph 55.2, it is odd that Mr. Molefe should now assert that it was strange because the approval of the projects would have been on the agenda. Otherwise, it would have not been served there. That is, that must be correct. Is that correct? No, it, well, it, was it, it, it is correct. It was on the agenda. It would have been part of the, the FICP report, his committee's report. And he said that for it, for that to have happened, it would have had to have gone through the whole process from the Bid Evaluation Committee, the Bid Adjudication Committee, the FCIP Committee, and uh, it was after that that this project would be, uh, it, that the matter would be referred to the board, since there was nothing strange about that. The strange thing, Chairperson, I repeat, is that the probity that that committee and the board needed to uh, be satisfied of was not done. Uh, it's not, the dispute is not whether it went through various supply chain committees. So, so I can't dispute what he says about the various supply chain committees that uh, the matter went through. Uh, Mr. Bittelezi then goes on in paragraph B, or subparagraph B, to say that the projects were in fact urgent because there was a need for a new dep depot to accommodate the new fleet of trains. The old depot was not appropriate. And he says, you owned, in your evidence, owned that there was an urgency but the evidence leader, being myself, then attributed the question of urgency to you. You may want to respond to that. No, the, 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 the project indeed, we said, was part of the modernization of, uh, of, uh, of the rolling stock and rail. So it, it was urgent in view of the fact that they were trains that were under manufacturing in Brazil. But uh, it does not derogate from the fact that uh, the board needed probity and it was strange that the board was required to approve without these checks and balances. So, so I agree with Mr. Telezi that it was agent. All right. Uh, so the strangeness then is not on account of it's not being urgent. So what was it on account of? He said it your, was your because comment. of the probity. It, 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 is on, it, it is on account of assurance not being given to the board and not having been given to the committee itself that was bringing the submission to the board. That, that, uh, that uh, uh, there was adequate probity conducted. Okay, then at paragraph 55.3, he says that in your evidence on the 29th of June, you said that he was pushing the approval uh, of the two projects. And you concluded by saying, whether there was a motive or not, 
I do not know. I do not want to impute any motive. He says, this innuendo is unacceptable. I have nothing to gain by submitting to the board the approval of the projects. And it was a submission of the committee, a committee which he has, he shared, there was no motive. What is your Jefferson, my, my statement does say that I'm not ascribing any, or yes. any, any yes. motive. I don't know what more one can say, but yeah. I respect, I respect that uh, Mr. Butelezi uh, reading that uh, sentence felt that there were certain innuendos uh, that sat uncomfortably with him. Yeah. So I can't, I can't dispute yeah. that that's how he felt. Yes. Then at paragraph 55.4, he says the board, uh, Mr. Mulefe says that the board required a probity report as assurance that there had been proper compliance. And you repeated that evidence on the 12th of March, uh, 2020. It raises a number of matters relating to that comment. It says, one, I was not aware the approval of the projects had become contentious until uh, the March 2020, when you gave uh, evidence. What is your reaction to that? Chairperson, the factual position is that that same board meeting which Mr. Butelezi attended Mm. said that it could not give a final approval to that tender uh, unless the property report, which Mr. Montana had assured the board that uh, it was available, was given to the chairperson of the board and to the chairperson of the audit committee. We, the board gave approval subject to that report. So the absence of that report is what would then have made the, the, the project contentious. Uh, and uh, it is a matter of record that uh, in the end, Mr. Uh, management, through the then acting group CEO, Ms. Martha Ngoi, had confirmed that in fact, uh, there had not been any property report that the uh, property officer, uh, officers who were the Gobot uh, Nkaluba or Sikela Nkaluba, the auditors of the time, um, their contract had expired before <laughs> that process of that tender was finalized. And there was no way in which they would have given a property report. And on the basis of that, which is an issue that was raised in the presence of Mr. Utelez in that board meeting, uh, the, the contract was held in abeyance because it was made clear that the preferred bidders should not be advised that they are preferred bidders until such a time that the property report was submitted to the chairman of the board and to the chairman of the Audit and Risk Committee of Brasa. You refer, Mr. Mulefe, to um, auditors in regard to the availability of that report. I understood previously, and I think it may have been from the evidence of Ms. Ngoy, that uh, there would have been somebody who would have been an employee of PRASA whose function would have included uh, preparing such a report, but that that person or employee or officer or official had uh, resigned or had left PRASA uh, or had not been there for quite some time. He, he, does that... Uh, uh, accord with your own memory whether that was the case or whether it would have been prepared by the auditors? I, I didn't follow closely the evidence of Miss uh, Martha. Uh, yes. Boy. But yes. Prasa would have had mm. the, 
the compliance person in the company who would have had to ensure that the, there is a probity uh, report. But to yeah. subject these things to assessment, which then produces a probity report, would have mm. been a function of the internal audit of mm. PRASA. And the internal audit of PRASA mm. was uh, capacitated by the, uh, the audit external auditors. Uh, external auditors, but they not called, they are external auditors, but who are providing internal audit support. They are not the normal auditors yeah. who audit Transnet. Yeah. Yeah. They work there inside yeah. uh, to yeah. check regularly these yeah. high value contracts. They basically wear a different hat. They wear a different hat. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Of probity. Of probity. Yes. In regard to probity. Yeah. Mr. Sony, Mr. Sony, do you have any recollection of what I'm talking about? Uh, I'm, I'm going to I'm just going to refer you to it, Chairperson. Yes, okay. Uh, if you look at paragraph 19 of Mr. Molefe's affidavit, the last sentence. Oh he yes. See, he says, on the contrary, the board was later told that there could not have been a probity report as the contract of the property officer had expired at least 12 months earlier. I think that is yes. the evidence you recall, Chair. Yes, I think I that do. is the evidence. Yes, 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 yes. You, you saw that, Mr. Mulefe? I, I saw it and I confirmed that that's what I yes. said. Okay, all right. Mr. Sony? As you please, Chair. I'm not going to be much longer. We're right yes. near the end. Now, Mr. Monefe, there's just one thing I want to say to you, and I'd like your comment on it. In the last sentence of paragraph 55.4a, Mr. Butelezi said such that the board sometimes approved of contracts. He says contracts, uh, such conditions would include a successful conclusion of a contract, favorable outcome of property exercise, to ensure that they had been compliance with the PRASA prescripts by everybody in the procurement and award chain, including the board. I think what he's trying to say there is that in those circumstances, it's not unusual to have a condition such as where it will, the approval will depend on a successful probity report or a clean probity report? I can't dispute what uh, Mr. Butelez is saying, Chairperson, but if indeed that is what he intended, that's the point he should have made mm. in the meeting to say, well, I recognize that the board is uncomfortable with the fact that there is no probity report. Mm. But I recommend that the board approves that the no contract would be uh, approved before, would be signed before this property element is brought in. So uh, in any event, you can't even sign a contract and say this contract is signed, but is subject to a property mm -hmm. report. With the property report must come before you sign the contract. Mm -hmm. because then you are satisfying yourself that you, you are observing proper governance uh, uh, issues uh, and you are acting in the best interests uh, of the company, protecting the company. Uh, once, 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 the board, once the board let it go, it goes into the hands of other people. It's not the board that then deals with the contract. Mm -hmm. So the board had to make sure as to what is the mandate that it gives? So, uh, I, are you saying that uh, if the idea on his part and maybe on the part of his board had been what he now says here in the affidavit, namely, they would be prepared to approve the conclusion of the contract on condition that 
uh, or they would approve maybe in principle uh, the contract, but uh, say subject to uh, an acceptable probity report, you are saying you would have expected him to make, to have made that point at the meeting when this issue of the property report was raised. That is correct, Chep. There's two points to make. Mm. I can't dispute that the board mm. of which Mr. Mutelezi was the chairperson mm. followed that modus operandi. I can't dispute it because I was not yeah. there. Yes. But I am saying mm. Having the benefit of that experience and the modus operandi, one would have expected that he would have taken the board that I was chair of into mm. confidence and advised that you can actually proceed with mm. this tender, uh, mm. even though the property report is not available. We would not have had to reconvene on the 23rd of December to appoint property uh, mm an audit firm to do property for us. Mm. Okay. Mr. Sonny? Could you please share this? Now, in paragraph 55.4b, Mr. Butile, uh, Mr. Butilezi takes issue with a statement you make at paragraph 21 of your affidavit. You say, uh, and it's not everything that he complains about, but I'm just going to read that for context because this is what happens to the contract. It says, as a result on the 26th of March, the board canceled the tenders and asked- 26th of- uh, uh, February, of February 2015, sorry. Yeah, February 2015. Yes. The chairperson canceled, uh, the board canceled the tenders and asked management to reissue the RFPs. Now, that was what you said, and that's correct, am I right? That, that is correct, uh, chairperson. And uh, uh, remember, chairperson, mm. the board arrives at that position because uh, mm. the auditors appointed to assess the fairness in the pro process and its correctness advised the board that we could not, the board should not proceed with mm. the, the, the tender as it stood at the time, that mm. it needed to reissue it. Mm. No, yes. Before I go into the next part, the part that Mr. Butelezi challenges, I'd like to take you to paragraph 19 where you make the following statement in the second sentence. In regard to the probity report, Mr. Montana said the report, that's the probity report was available and he could not understand why it had not been included in the presentation. He undertook to provide it to the board as soon as possible. Now that's the background to what you then say at paragraph 21 after you make the point that the tenders were canceled. You then say, the board was very concerned that it had been misled by the CEO and senior management and demanded action be taken. Then you say to me, the extent to which Mr. Montana and the immediate past chairperson, uh, Mr. Butelezi had misled the board were indications of major governance challenges at Prasa, and it appears as if those responsible, uh, or who, those whose responsibility it, it was to enforce governance were in fact weakening it. So it's this comment that Mr. Butelezi takes offense to at paragraph um, 54, uh, sorry, 55, uh, 54 point, uh, 55.4b, where he says, Mr. Molefe claims that I misled the board. And he says in this, and I'd just like to read this and then we can deal with your reaction to it. He seems he, ba he bases this fact on, he bases this on the fact 
that I did not contradict the CEO when he told the board at the meeting of the 27th of November 2014 that a probity report did exist at that stage, even before the board had made a decision on the projects. Since I am sitting at a disadvantaged position, as I am expected to recall each and every detail of what transpired or what was said during a specific meeting more than six years ago without the benefit of any minutes. I do not remember what the group CEO said at the meeting regarding the probity report. It is odd to me that the assurance of one person are attributed to me, that person being Mr. Montana. It is Mon Mr. Montana on Mr. Molefe's own version who gave the assurances to the board about the existence of the probity report. In any event, if that is what Mr. Montana said, I would have no reason to contradict him in the absence of information to the contrary. My silence on an issue on which I had no information to the contrary cannot and should not be interpreted as misleading the board. Just like your reaction to that, because that's what seems to uh, be of serious concern to Mr. Petilis. Well, we can, we, we, uh, Chairperson, we can at length debate the issues, but I just okay. want to deal with it narrowly to say, firstly, to admit that Mr. Utelezi did not speak in that meeting, and uh, therefore uh, the statement on him misleading the board okay is premised on the fact that as the chair of the FICP Finance mm. Capital Investment and Procurement Committee of the board, mm. he should have been aware that the property report was not there. And him being aware that it was not there, he should have at least said to the board that uh, uh, we are sorry that when we brought this report here, we didn't think that we needed to look into property. And again, that raises this question where he says they were used to putting it as a condition uh, mm. for the signing of the contract. But mm. in all fairness, I, I must say that uh, that he misled the board is based on the assumption that he was away uh, mm. and, and mm. that he did not speak. Mm. And if he was not aware, it falls away. If he was not aware, it falls away, Chairperson. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yes. And, Mr. and of Sonny. course, that allegation that is made at paragraph uh, 21 is made with the full knowledge thereafter that there was no probity officer who had left 12 months ago and there could not be a probity report. Now, it may be that Mr. Butelezi was not aware of that fact, that there could not be a property. And, and I mean, I'm just endorsing what the chairperson has said, that that allegation of Mr. Butelezi misleading the board would then fall away as well. Yeah, no, I agree, chairperson. Uh, oh. uh, yeah. <laughs> In the absence of the of the compliance office, I think you, you would have called him or her for 12 months or so. Uh, that wouldn't mean that no probity report could be made. Um, or let me put it this way. Would that mean that no probity report could be made? Or could that mean that a probity report could be made, but in that event, Plus, I would have needed external auditors to put on the head of internal auditors and therefore do the report. Would you know who, which one it would mean? The latter. It, it the latter. Would mean the latter. And in fact, yes. that is what happened. Yes. Uh, the board convened a special meeting uh, uh, recognizing the urgency of the matter. Yeah. Uh, to appoint. Uh, auditors who were giving internal audit capacity to Prasa to mm. do 
a, an urgent assessment of, of mm. that report. And they did. Having mm. done so, they produced a report that says this process was fatally flawed mm. and we recommend to the board that the board does not proceed with this tender, but the mm. board rather reissues it. Mm. Uh, so so that, that's what the position uh, was. Generated. Yes, yes. Now, the, the, this might be something that relates to Mr. Mutana rather than to Mr. Butelezi. Uh, Mr. Sonny, do you remember whether we reached a point with Mr. Montana where he would deal with the, this issue, namely Mr. Mulefe's evidence that at that meeting of the board, he, that is Mr. Montana, advised the board that there was a property report. Do you, do you remember whether he has dealt with that either on affidavit or on oral evidence? And if so, what he has said? Jefferson, I must confess, I, I can't recall. What I do recall is, you might remember that attached to Mr. Molefe's affidavit is mm. the report, the assessment report at PM3, mm. uh, which is at the bottom of uh, paragraph 20. Mm. And we went through that report with Mr. Montana. Mm -hmm. And he accepted mm -hmm. that they, based on what had happened, it was mm -hmm. necessary to, to, to reissue the tenders. Mm -hmm. What I cannot recall, and I will go through the transcript again, is mm -hmm. the question or his response to the allegation that mm -hmm. there could not be a probity report because there was no probity officer. Because I remember putting that to him. I just mm -hmm. simply cannot remember his answer. Mm. But do you recall whether he he admitted or denied that at that board meeting he said there was a, a property report available? I, you can't I, remember. I, 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 that I, I will I will have to look. You have to check. Right. Okay, no, that's fine. Uh, okay, are, are, are you done with Mr. I, I am done with Mr. Mulefe. Yes. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Mr. Mulefe. Um, I think, Mr. Sony, with regard to any other issues that uh, uh, may still need to be dealt with, that Mr. Mulefe might need to deal with, um, attempts should be made to try and have that uh, those issues dealt with without any undue delay. Uh, um, maybe I may as well say this while Mr. Mulefe is listening. Uh, if possible, if we are going to have a session where he deals with such issues, particularly those uh, emanating from Mr. Montana uh, and maybe any other witness actually, uh, it would be good if we could try and find a space sometime next week. I would imagine we, we should not need more than an hour uh, to deal with them. Uh, but obviously, Mr. Mulefe will only be able to react to a particular date that uh, you will suggest to him. Yes. 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 Thank you very much, Mr. Mulefe, for availing yourself once again. Uh, you are now excused. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. Thank you. Uh, Chairperson shouldn't be too nice to some witnesses. <laughs> I, I I thought I tried to be <laughs> to be okay to every witness, but I know that I get accused <laughs> of being nice, yeah. to, uh, nice to some, you know. <laughs> but uh, when you when you when you chair a commission such as this, you have got to expect to have all kinds of things. Uh, said about you and how you treat witnesses. There's not much one can do about it. One must just continue to try and do the job as best one can. But thank you very much, Mr. Mulefe. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sony, we, we, we are done then for the we day. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Chairperson, we, before yes. we conclude this, Mm. Uh, I don't want to 
raise things unnecessarily. But yeah. it would be unfortunate for, I submit, the commission as a whole. Mm. If certain allegations made in Mr. Butilezi's affidavit about the investigating team and mm. the, the, the legal team, in particular the, the evidence leader, that certain mm. things were not done, mm. go unanswered. I'm not going to use this opportunity. This is not the, the, mm. it's neither the occasion nor the time to do it. Mm. Just to say, Chairperson, that when it is said that the evidence leader should have been aware of this, this, and this, mm. it is impossible to mm. for an evidence leader especially where an allegation is made about what happened at a particular meeting without mm. it being said that mm. there were consequences flowing from that meeting. Mm. 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 So I just want to place on record, Mr. Jefferson, that in mm. a, at an appropriate time, mm. the, the manner in which we operate will mm. be set out so that yeah. it is not deemed as if our silence constitutes acceptance of the yeah. criticisms made. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, no, that's... that. And, that's, and that's, of yourself as well, Chip. Of course. I, that's of that's course, why I said it in yes, context. Yes, no, no, no. Uh, uh, I have... Uh, uh, I have been accused... <laughs> on too many of, occasions. Of all kinds of things. Yes. Um, but I guess that, uh, you know, when you take a job such as chairing this kind of commission, you you must know that <laughs> it comes with the territory. Uh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know you will face all kinds of accusations, and not everybody will will be happy with you, and not everybody will think you are you are fair to everybody, and uh, that's uh, that's that's just what it is. Yes. Yeah. But uh, uh, thank you. So we'll we'll adjourn the proceedings for today. We adjourn, and, and, and I will let you know about Mr. Molefe's recall, yes. possible recall changes. Yeah, no, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Recording stopped. <laughs>